The River Trent, it's my favourite venue and thousands of other anglers love this venue and it's no wonder why, when you look at the scenes you've got on this beautiful river. So Collingham, where we're fishing today, is on the very, very upper limit of the tidal river. And the sort of lower stretch, which is Torxton, then it comes through Lauterton and Dunham, then into North Clifton, South Clifton, Bestorp and a few other venues. They're all on this particular bank that I'm talking around. Other venues are called, or other sections are called different things, depending on the village that's relevant to them. But here at Collingham is right at the upper stretches. Peg one. We're on peg 86 today. Peg 1, which is upstream, is the famous Cromwell Weir. Now, that's been fantastic for match fishing, and in later years, it's been an amazing specimen uh, venue with massive barbel, carp, chub, and obviously a whole host of other fish that this beautiful river contains. Now, the interesting thing about Collingham is that, yes, it's tidal, but it's not quite as... Uh, powerfully it's not affected as much by the tide as it is in the lower stretches because the kind of tide runs out of energy so although you do get a lift uh, and, a, and a fall in the river in the in the levels um, you don't really get the effect of you know the power coming back upstream and therefore you don't get the color and I think this part of the river is sort of slightly different than it is let's say the lower stretches of Dunham and Torxey there's not quite as much silt and, and I think that's why there's more gravels and therefore it lends itself to more barbel and chub fishing. I mean, I love the trend and I think I would say that if I had to sort of choose a part of it, it would be the tidal. But Collingham's not really a venue that I've fished uh, that often in recent years. Dunham and that, the lower uh, tidal parts have been my um, sort of stomping ground in the past. But this part of the river is fantastic it's quite bendy there's lots of glides and there's lots of different parts of the river and the section that we're on today is quite interesting because we're actually between two great big horseshoe bends and then the peg that we sat on is situated right at the very end of a narrow sort of nip in the river so it comes round the bend above me and all the, you know most of the flow is on the other bank but because the river is uh, at its probably at its narrowest in a fair length of river, this is the narrowest part, just above me, it kind of channels the water and speeds it up, and then immediately where we are, it kicks out wide to a cow drink, and below me, it's, it's quite a wide section. So I think what's happening is here, you've got a lot of oxygen, a lot of flow, and the food gathers through, and it creates perfect conditions for barbel and chub. So we've picked this spot, and I know that it's a nice hard bottom, and we're just going to try and tackle it on a feeder and see if we can catch some of these resident fish. So I'm just going to put some bait out and create a bit of a bed. And although I'm actually going to be feeding with a large feeder, I do want to kickstart the peg off. Now I'm sure that there's a lot of fish here already waiting, but I want to just be sure that I can chuck in when I've got milk on and just leave it for a little while. So I kind of want to get some baiting so I can just sit there and wait for a big fish to come up. I don't think, I mean, I'd like to think that you could get bites really quickly and be chucking in winding fish back, but with big fish, sometimes you've got to be a little bit more patient. So by setting up your peg, it means that when you do chuck out with your baited hook and loaded feeder, you can leave it there with a little bit more confidence. So. Emp, casters, emp's a fantastic bait on this river. Casters, both crunchy baits, little bit of meat, as in traditional luncheon meat, which I've cubed up into eight mil cubes, and some small halibut pellets, some like three, three and a half, four millis, just to make sure I've got that, and I'm just binding that into a boshing feeder like that, with some crushed hemp that I've mixed with hemp and alley crush sono baits. It's purely hemp and alibut pellets 
ground up. And that just binds the crushed hemp that I've mixed it with, which I soaked. A little bit of warm water this morning before I set off, just to get the juices flowing out of the hemp. And basically that mixed together just gives me a little binder so I can get all them loose particles just to the bottom and that's going to quickly release and then just pull them out of feed like that so I know I've got a nice big bed of, bed of bait there. And hopefully the resident fish of this beautiful river will come and snaffle all that up. I'm going to pay a nice big bow out so that I can hold bottom nice and hopefully that should just hold bottom but that's just moved and I've got bigger feeders on my tray but I'd really like to fish with the lightest feeder I can get away with and that's for various reasons. First and foremost, they're easier to cast. Secondly, when you do get a fish, it picks your bait up, it'll dislodge the, dislodge the feeder and help to hook the fish. And then also, when you're playing a fish, you don't want tons of weight dragging around rocks and getting you fast. Get stuck on bottom, basically. So. The lighter the feeder, the better. But you have to make sure you're fishing, so I feel like that could just do with being the next one up. That were a typical tap and rattle. And I don't think that's a barbel. They tell me there's a few chub in this bit of river. And that's on three casters and that's only just the second cast. I mean wouldn't it be nice to catch some good old chub? This river used to be solid with them but like all things it changes and the fish population change. And what you catch changes obviously. Look at that look, a feisty little character. One of God's beautiful creatures. A chub, not a big fish, but I'll tell you what, beautiful, great to see it. On only the second cast, we're into one of the Trent's finest chub. Better get me discarded for that, he wanted that. Beautiful fish. Let's see if we can catch ourselves another chub. I have got a bit of a soft spot for chub because I, when I used to come up river as a, a kid, that was probably the most predominant species. Yeah, there were roach, but there were, there'd been a massive explosion of chub and they were little chub, and they were quite, you know, obviously ferocious in, in how they fed, so you could catch them. And, you know, we are talking about all our yesterdays. Right from the upper trend, which I sometimes had the luxury of going to, right the way through the middle trend, and I remember Kaythorpe especially. Kaythorpe used to be black with chublets, and I remember a period where you didn't even take a rod rest because the bites were that plentiful that they were taking it as it at bottom and people, I remember, um, you know, not, I think Barnes lads were included, but Goldthorpe lads and um, Smithies were going to places like Fiskerton and it was just full of chub. And that's where methods like the dink dink came along where we've, p p people fished at four inch up length above the feeder because the fish were that aggressive that they were actually attacking your feeder, so the best way to catch them was actually to put your hook at the side of the feeder. But, 
you know, they thinned out a bit and then the only ones you'd really catch were big. And slowly but surely, they kind of disappeared. Um, I remember, what would it be now, 10 years ago? On a national, I caught some big ones, but they look like really old fish. And I actually think there's a chance that we could, like all fish life cycles, see a bit of a comeback. So I'm just concentrating on where I'm casting because I don't really want to fish with the clip. So I can pair that big bow off. So I'm just making sure that I'm slowing the feeder down before it hits the water so I can accurately gauge where it's landing. So I like to fish a fairly tight spot if I can. But I don't always worry about fishing a clip. A lot of people want to fish a clip and that means you've got fish over your lead. I prefer not to, so I can put that big boy in my line and as I said earlier, fish with that lighter, lighter lead. But going back to the chub, I know that people are catching lots of chub. Um, recently, there were a big match weight on this stretch here at Collingham. Mark Hawksworth, who was a brilliant angler, Britain brilliant river angler, um, caught some on a big float, uh, fish up to five and a half pound. So I don't know if it's just chub time again and the cycle's coming round. But there used to be loads of gudgeon, which they reckon the chub used to feed on, and they disappeared and also the chub at a similar time, whether that's, I'm not a scientist or a fish doctor, but I believe that they coincided. Because of course we had the explosion of what I used to call hybrids, pommies or silver bream, whatever you want to call them. The river were black with them after that, and they've gone. And it's been a brilliant roach river for a few years of late, and more so, more predominantly, it's been dace. And dace weren't a common thing back uh, in this part of the river, in the tidal on the middle trend. There were always plenty of upper trend. But that's been a prominent species for the last 10 years. Dace and, uh, dace and roach. And of course, there's massive bream shoals in the river. Uh, and there's always been bream, but I think they've kind of flourished. Um, but, but we've also developed how we fish, and I think we've, we've been a bit more positive how we fish. We've put more... Bit. I mean, we used to float fish quite a lot. And we were always quite negative. I mentioned earlier about small hooks and maggot feeders, but that's match fishing. And I think once people discovered the fact that they could be a little bit more positive in how they fished, bigger baits, bigger hooks, heavier feeders, stronger line, bigger rods, I think we've exploited what were probably some big shoals of fish that were ignored. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking about how we used to see the river downstream at Dunham, which were the Rotherham Water, where I used to fish quite a lot, there were some slate beds which were below the dubs and above the strait, above the bridge. A bit of a cyanide area. Nobody wanted to draw it because it was dead shallow. But you'd chuck out of there and you'd wait for one bite off a chub, so they say. And they were on a chub. But I remember getting cracked off and got my rod dragged in and got my arms pulled off. And then I look back and wonder if they were barbel. And they probably were, but we didn't gear up for them. We were still using old-fashioned 1.7 bear and 2.1 if you were being a little bit adventurous. And of course, you were never going to get a barbell out on one of them. So we probably don't know what's been swimming around in this river. And we certainly don't these days with sturgeon, catfish, massive barbel by the hundreds, great big chub. Big shoals of bream. What a great place. So feeder choice for a peg like this on the river. For me, the best feeder is a block end feeder. I do carry open ends with me because if I want to put in more baits and I want to put it in quickly, I feel like I can, I can fill an open end of feeder and cap it off and, and sort of bait up. But if I want to sit and wait for a bite, I want that bait to be more contained. And when I'm fishing particles only, which can be maggots, but in this case it's hemp and castor, then there's nothing finer than a block end. Now my feeder of choice is the Camasan Black Cap, and this is a large. Now they do go up to 50 gram, which in some parts of the river can be sufficient. 
but there's quite a bit of flow here and it's quite narrow so it's trapping it's, it's fast and because we're fishing uh, and we know there's some big fish in the area we've got sort of thicker line on which then means you've got more pull on your line and therefore you need a heavier feeder and fortunately I've got some conversion weights that I've actually added to the feeder so I just swap out the leads that they come with and um, that'll take me up to two and a half three and even four ounces but what's more important and interesting that I carry a few feeders that I've adapted and the standard holes are great if you're fishing with maggots but when uh, there's a couple of things if you're fishing sort of emp and casters they're not quite as active so I need them to eject from the feeder a lot a lot faster and a lot easier so I've elongated and opened up the holes and I've got varying ones I mean I've actually cut slots between two of the holes on those so it really comes out if I'm getting fast bites if I were catching smaller fish small chub dace and things like that and then I've got some which I've just opened the holes out uh, ordinarily so that I know for a fact that there's enough water passing through the feeder to wash a bit of bait out as it bounces as it's landing and also when I hook the fish but then sort of the ultimate one which is the one that I'm actually catching on is this one which I've actually cut the bottom out now you can do this two ways you can actually swap it round take the cap off and pass the power gun back through the little hole in the bottom of the feeder but I've actually because I just like how the line comes through the center of uh, my, my power gun comes to the centre of the cap I've actually just sawn it off with a little axe saw and what I'm doing with that is I'm scooping it through my emp and casters and pellets and then smudging it off and capping it off with that crushed emp and emp and alley crush so that I'm get, I know for a fact that I'm getting a dump of bait so feeder lands on the bottom that, that'll sort of dissolve the um, and come away the, the crushed emp and then I know if I get a bite I'm leaving a feeder full of bait ready for my next fish so I'm getting the bait exactly where I want it not spread all over the peg so just you know I do have smaller ones in case the fishing's tough and I'm only fishing for an odd fish but I think if I'm on a few fish I want plenty of bait and that is the feeder to use in these circumstances no and that was an interesting bite because I thought that was small fish because we put that three casters back on I mean I'd had that up bait I'd had that chub and I thought well that's a great up bait but then I came back and the casters were either smashed or gone and I thought ah oh, there's too many small fish so I put six maggots on the same hook just to make sure that I'd got a sizable bait that's not as easily damaged but I never had a sign on it. So I put my three casters back on and sure enough, we've got one. And I'm pretty certain that this is a barbel. That energetic fight that you get from these fish is unmistakable. I think it'll probably want to have another lunge when it gets close to the surface, as they do. Not a massive fish, but usually it's these that rattle and really, really want to fight. Beautiful fish. There he is, look. That unmistakable lunge as they hit the surface. Prime Muscle, gorgeous River Trent Barbel. Whatever fish is your favourite, you cannot fail to be an admirer of a beautiful Trent Barbel. I mean, look at that. That's the first one we've caught today. Hopefully, one of a few. But we'll just take, drink that in. That's a beautiful fish. Really hard scrapping. King of the River. Right, let's get him slipped back so we can uh, catch him another day. Swim had gone a little bit, you know, I thought it were quite, we had that chub quite quick and then a few busted casters. So obviously I'd put that bigger bait on with a bunch of maggots just to make sure that I could actually sit with the bait. But 
I never had an indication on it. I put casters back on and probably feeder had been in five minutes in a proper rattle, which I thought were a small fish. Turned out to be a, a nice barbel, the first one of the session. So patience is obviously a key there and not to get too excited, but I, I have to confess I'd already got my air rigs at the ready because I thought maybe I needed a, a piece of meat on a quick stop and an air rig or maybe a eight mil pellet or a six mil pellet. I don't like fishing massive pellets because I think that the fish are kind of wary of big baits, but when you're feeding particles like um, casters, bits of meat and small pellets, they grub around on bottom and I always think it's important to not... Oh, that nearly pulled my rod in. Do you know, that could have been a foul looker because that was a really strange bite. Or maybe not. Because that one has done me. That's probably because we're talking to camera and not paying attention to what we're doing. Always fish with a nice long tail. This one will be just over a metre. Probably a metre and a quarter. I've pre-tied these actually to over a metre and a half. Because sometimes you've just got to get that bait to lay down on the bottom where I think when you're fishing small baits, like I like to fish for these fish, they're not heavy, so they're not pinning you up to the bottom. So by fishing a longer up length, it does a couple of things. One is um, to pin the bait down to the bottom, and two is to drop it away from your feeder. So any fish that are kind of being wary, they'll, um, and they're sitting back off your feeder, then you can obviously just catch them off the back of your feed area and I think that's probably important just to note and well worth remembering if you're out barbel fishing that the ferocious feeders but they don't always want to come right up to your feeder. That was an incredible bit of action because I actually thought we'd miss that proper tap slack <laughs> as they call it which as I mentioned earlier dislodges the feeder and everything dropped back slack and I finally caught up with it after about four or five wines which is incredible this one feels a little bit bigger than the last fighting a little bit different. And it's mid-river. And let the fish do the work. Not try and pull its head off because what they'll actually be doing is swimming mid-floor. And the trick is just to swim the fish along and it's heading upstream. I can see my line where it's entered in the water. And then again, you'll just get that look, a little run. Just be patient, let it, be, let it have its head. And you'll get your little moments where you can gain a bit of ground on it. But just take your time. Strong, powerful fish. And we're bullying each other, that's what's happening. There you go, back in control to the fish. And if you're trying to pull when that fish decides to go the other way, I'm afraid you'll be parting company, so just be patient with him. Most of these fish have never been caught, you see, so... Especially these smaller ones that we're probably going to encounter, not the double-figure fish. They're fresh and young. And there you go, look, that fish is right in front of me now. But as soon as they see a bit of daylight, 
They always. Make a run. So I'll just be. Just take a note of that and make sure that, like at this moment, when he wants to wiggle up, you think the fight's over and it's not. I can't think of anything more exhilarating than a wild creature like a Trent Barbel. Beautiful creatures. There he goes, look, look at that. Oh, beautiful. Five or six pound, that one. I would say, full of muscle. Look at that, stunning. So we're putting casters through our feeder, so what better bait to put on the hook than what we lose feeding? The fish out there are probably grubbing on the bottom, picking up the hemp and the casters. So three casters on a 12, which is small, it's big enough bait to deter the small fish, but still attractive to the great big creatures that are lurking in this swim out here. Freezing. Well, the barbel seemed to have turned up and that one has turned up and it wants to leave quickly as well. And I've set my clutch because I've got my back wind on because obviously it's flowing quite a lot and the floor would actually pull your reel handle backwards. So trouble with that is if you get a really fierce bite, a bit like that one, sometimes your line's that tight, you can't get enough slack to get your, to get your clip off. So it just pays to have your clutch. I mean, personally, I like to play my fish off my back wind, but as I said, my reactions might not be as fast as the barbel, so this fish is a definitely pulling back and it feels like a better fish. What you sometimes get with a three to five pound barbel, they seem to be a little bit more giddy, whereas bigger ones gear long lunges and good hard fights. And that fish is just holding the current in the middle of the river, commanding is half of this fight, I think, is the truth. And it's all these are on that triple caster because them fish are feeding on them casters that we're feeding, so we're feeding that we're putting at the beginning, and they just love that crunchiness along with the hemp and the pellets and the bits of meat that we put in. But casters on the hooks are great bait. And that bite were another drop back bite. Just tips gone slack, dislodged that feeder. And of course, because I've got a bow in my line, the fish has dislodged the feeder and it's probably catching up with that bow. And that's why it goes slack until you catch up with the fish and the fight begins. Really powerful fish, that one. There he is. Beautiful. Trent Barbel. Well, look at that. What a session this is turning out to be. We'd be happy with that first barbel, but this is number three. What a fantastic place this is.
these magnificent fish from the River Trent, there's nothing beats a river barbel. And that little specimen there gives us a right good scrap. And I must admit, I've forgotten how enjoyable catching these fish are. But I just want to take care of him because he's a big, big old fish. And that one is on triple caster as well. So it just goes to show you, you don't need great big baits to catch big fish. Small baits, they're grazing and they're loving casters today. So this big, fast, aggressive river is synonymous with big baits. But obviously as a match angler, my experience is that when you're fishing in the daytime, big pellets, boilies, that sort of thing, which obviously a lot of people use to catch these big barbel on the river, they're not always effective in, in the daytime. And because obviously we're match anglers, we fish maggots and casters and emp, ordinarily for roach and bags of fish that are gonna help us to win um, money and matches, we know that these fish feed on smaller baits and particles are really important. Now, when I come to a river, maggots are fantastic, but I think the more natural baits, casters and hemp, and what I mean by that is the crunchy, I think the more akin to what's on the bottom, so you've got lots of snails in the river and sort of like caddis fly larvae and things like that. So my approach to fishing a peg like this when I'm trying to catch sort of a, a better net fish, the basis is hemp and casters. So I brought myself a couple of packs of casters and I brought myself three packs of hemp. But along with that, because obviously I do know that the fish do like um, fish meal, especially halibut pellets, I've actually brought some very small ones. So not like the six and eight and 14 mil pellets that people like to use for catching big fish, but these are actually like grains of hemp. And I think what that does is it gives the smell and the taste that the fish obviously associate with, with food. But they're small enough to, uh, for the fish to graze on, but more importantly, they're also small enough to come through the holes of a blocking feeder. So I like that. Um, that is an addition to me, uh, M for my casters. And then I brought a tin of lunch of meat, which I've cubed up into eight mil pieces. And I fed that at the start with the thoughts of if there were too many small fish in my peg, I could always put one of those on a hair rig. And then lastly, I've actually got some crushed hemp, which I've mixed with hemp and alley crush. So I've got probably got two parts um, crushed hemp to one part hemp and alley crush, um, which gives me, it's not a ground bait, it's basically all I've done is, I've used that at the beginning when I'm trying to get my particles in with an open-ended bait up feeder. That allows me just to cap off the feeder. And then when I'm fishing, I've got some blocking feeders, which I've actually took the bottom out, which I'll show you in a while. Uh, and that allows me to fill up the feeder with the particles and just cap it off. And what I like about that is that if I'm getting quick bites, I know for a fact that when the fish picks up my bait and rattles my feeder, the contents will come out. So I'm always fishing. I'm not dragging bait all over the river. And I'm getting the feed into the swim, which is also important because, you know, you need a nice big feeder. These fish are hungry. Once they come over that bed of feed, they're gonna, they're gonna wanna be crunching away on all these particles. So I always prepare myself for quite an amount of bait. So I've not got big pellets, I've not got boilies, I've not got massive baits because I just wanna show you that basically everything in here eats all these particles and small baits and you don't necessarily have to fish in a specimen style to catch big fish. Well, that's been a blistering hour or so and the fish are still feeding and of course they've come in on that bait and really got their heads down and basically, I'm not going to say it's been a barbell or chuck, but it pretty much, pretty much has. And I think like most venues, there's always a period in the day when fish seem to feed and on this particular part of the river, which of course is tidal, that can be a real window and fish like barbel will definitely respond to the flow. And I think the flow is at its strongest because of course the tide is actually dropping. So it's dropped probably six or eight inches here since I set my box up this morning. And I think the tide is due to come back on 
sort of late in the afternoon, probably six o'clock-ish. Now, we're right at the very, very top of the tidal trend. Just upstream is Cromwell Weir, and that signals the end of the tidal and takes you then into what's known as the middle trend. And you don't get... Now, look at that thing. I thought that were a bit strange that we didn't get that lunge. And that is not a barbel. That is a big chub. And all of a sudden I'm playing it like the crown jewels because I really want to see this fish. That's funny that because I've not had a barbel bite the last two casts. And I wonder if them fish just backing off has made way for that handsome beast to get up onto the bait. Nothing finer than a big chub, I can assure you of that. Look at that cracker. That's getting up for four pound. Look at that. Beast of a fish. Incredible. So what I was saying about the, the tidal is that this, this part is the upper reaches of the tidal section. It's probably only a couple of miles upstream. We're on peg 87 and peg one is the very, very top of the tidal trend. So the tide doesn't affect the levels as much here as what it does in the lower reaches. So for instance, Torxy, which is probably one of the most um, downstream match sections, the tide there is ferocious. It can rise six, seven foot in a match and fall again if the tide's in the middle of the match or the high tide is that. But here, it's a little bit more gentle and less effective. But nonetheless, we might not be able to see a massive difference in what's happening, but the fish certainly can. And I think we're right at the bottom, getting to the bottom of the tide. And that probably just affects the flow. I've noticed that a few more boils have, have appeared uh, in my swim. Because as the level drops, obviously the current running over the, the contours of the rocks and the bottom, that'll kick up the water and just create sort of swirls and boils, which ultimately then also moves the bait and sometimes just gets them fish to start feeding. And sure enough, it's been a great period in, in the session. And who knows, it might change. It might all of a sudden be a few chub because the barbel might have decided that the floor's not right for them or they might have dropped downstream a little bit. You know, catching, keep catching fish certainly is going to disturb them and I might need to reintroduce some more bait in bulk. I might have to put that bigger feeder back on. But they're the sorts of things that you need to be aware of on a river that's, I'm going to say, a little bit more alive than a still water or a, a pond or a lake. You've got to work with it because it's a, a big moving water and fish are aggressive because they're on the move all the time a little bit more hungry, but their feeding sort of patterns will change. So just be aware of the levels and try and catch the river. If you're fishing for barbel and chub, they like that flow. Try and catch it on what we call a runoff. So basically it's at the highest and running away when you start your session rather than a split tide, because once that flow drops, because the obviously the tide's pushing back upstream and it starts to lift, you don't get the flow, and I think that a lot of these, especially barbel, they sort of like back off a little bit, they don't want to feed, and the fish come up in the water, and you don't catch them as effectively. Great for bream, um, sometimes can be great for small fish, but barbel and chub, they like nice fast flow, quite a lot of oxygen in the water. So try and pick your time and your tide when you want to fish a place like this. So the setup for today is a bit of a stout thing. Um, kicking off with a 13 foot rod. This is an 120 gram rated rod. It's an old uh, pressing rod and it's a very fast action. What I mean by that is that the tip powers up very quickly and kicks into the power rod of the rod, which makes it perfect for sort of lobbing very heavy feeders. I wouldn't say it were a brilliant distance rod, 
because of the action, but it's a brilliant sort of short to medium uh, distance weight casting rod. So that's suited. I've got a three ounce tip in it, which is nice and stiff because I don't really want my rod to be sort of bent over. I want to be able to see the tip, get little indications and bites. And I just feel that you hook fish differently like that. Um, that comes through. I've got a nice big reel on there. And that's loaded with 026, which is eight pound uh, detection, which is our mono. Really durable and will stand to the rigors of today. And then down to the business end, Basically, I've got a very simple rig. I've slid up the line a little rubber stopper, which is going to sit there, which is just under three inches above a knot. And I've got just a stop wrap round and sort of I've crimped that on with pliers to make sure it doesn't come off. And then I've got a twizzle section with a nice two inch loop at the bottom of that. So not like the double twizzle that I use when I'm fishing upstream. The reason for that is that these are different fish. I'm not looking to get little rattles on the back of that. And I want, if I get a big fish pulls really hard, that'll push that sliding stopper up the line. Now that's just to make sure that I don't get cracked off on the bite. It gives me a little bit more uh, forgiveness. Sometimes when you wind your barbell in, you'll finish up with that stopper right, with, right the way up the line when it's done, a, you know, had a really big run. That boom will just kick the rig out and you'll just see that sitting back over the top of that feeder. And then coupled to that, I've got a long hook length. And that is about 1.2 metres long. And I've just got that thumb stretched out so you'll see that comes right the way across up to there. The reason for that is I like a long hook length so I believe that a nice uh, small looking light bait, the pressure of the water will keep that nailed to the bottom. It also keeps the hook bait away from the feeder, which sometimes these fish just want to sit back, picking off the loose feed, it's falling off your feeder, and that's where the bait's landing and settling. On the end of that, that's O20 line, and on the bottom of that is a size 12 Drennan Super Spade. These hooks have been around for years, they've never let me down, I've used them in all sorts of situations, and they're perfect for what I'm going to do today, which is casters and possibly a bunch of dead maggots but you can just present them onto that they're dead sharp they're dead strong and you don't lose fish off them it's a dead simple setup really really simple and it's effective so let's give it a whirl so obviously it could be quite bewildering a river as big as this but i think you know there's some basic things that you need to look at when you come to a river like this and you know, obviously experience is a great thing, but if you're, if you're new to it, look for some key points. Think about where the fish holding areas might be. And you'll hear me say this um, many, many times about people when they go fishing. You can't always decide, I'm going to fish like that today. You've kind of got to look at the conditions, look at your surroundings, look at your peg, and try and find the best way to get the most from it. And this particular stretch here, you'll see above me, it's, it's got a big sweeping bend. So all the flow is further across. And ordinarily that would always indicate to me and a rule of thumb for me on the river was if I had a bend coming this way and pushing to the far bank, I fish further across. If I'm fishing on the inside of a bend like the one below me, I'd always fish shorter because ordinarily that's where the bottom's cleaner, where there's more flow and it's sort of scrape the bottom out and expose the gravel. And that's where all the natural food will flow. So that's a massive thing. It's, you know, choosing where you're going to fish. Then matching up to, you know, the target species, match your bait up to it, match your tackle up to it. So obviously we've fished today with casters and hemp because that's a real natural bait, but we're prepared with a few micro pellets and we've also got some meat and some up, up pellets if we needed it. So think about that. And then your tackle. Really important to get that right. You know, no point in taking a knife to a gunfight. If you need to hold bottom, make sure you've got some good leads with you, some big feeders, a nice strong rod, and some sturdy hooks. And I think patience is probably one of the most important ingredients to fishing. And, you know, when we set off, the fish, the, the barbel weren't there straight away. We caught that chub. And it would have been easy to start to swap and change. You know, it's not working. Do this, do that. Wait for the fish to come. The big fish... They don't always rush, it's their time. And as I said earlier, with this river, because it's tidal, there'll be moments in the day 
where it's a real sweet spot for the fish. And for us, it was probably as that river were falling, getting a little bit faster as the river got narrower and lower. And that just created that bit of flow that's lifted them fish and given us a fantastic day's fishing. Another fish that I actually thought I'd missed the bite on and they really, really get a good slap and then start swimming towards you because it's a bang, tip slack and you have to catch up with that fish and they're probably heading upstream. I've just got to watch this boat. If we share this river with some other people that enjoy it as much as we do. And he slowed down, which is really nice. And this feels like a good fish, because it's kind of just hugging the floor. It's going to drop my rod, just in case. But I think we're clear. That fish is heading upstream now. And at first, with a bite, I thought it were another chub. But there's no mistake in those powerful lunges of a River Trent barbel. Entertaining the passers-by on the boats. It's probably the most purple boat I've ever seen in my life. I've often considered residing on a boat because, I mean, why, why wouldn't you? You're on, you're on river, you can fish, live and eat and sleep on it. But I'd like to think I wouldn't get bored of fishing this place, but I'm sure if, it, uh, if you're on it 365 days a year, you'd probably tired of it because too much of a good thing they say and I was talking earlier about the fact that this river's changed and I do wonder years and years gone by when we didn't realize that these fish were in here and you say I got done by a chub on bite today and it snapped me clean off and it's probably one of these muscle machines that we just didn't realise we're living in the river, but there's one thing for sure, it's absolutely full of them these days. So if you get a chance to come to this venue, you should make the effort. It'd be really worthwhile. I'm sure we're gonna get another lunge out of this character. There he goes, look. Almost predictable. As soon as they get towards that daylight, so less haste, more speed, and there he is, look. Beautiful fish. and he's not ready yet. Just try and play him upstream if you can. And then sometimes when they hit the surface and it's time, you can just swim them downstream into your net. There he is. Oh, that's a stunning fish and a great way to end what can only be described as an epic session. What a stunning fish. Beautiful barbel, five or six pounds of solid muscle.